Okay, hi everybody. We are back. Okay, hold on. We have to do this other thing here. Okay, two, one, zero. Good. Okay, done. Hi everybody. We are back. Welcome uh, back to to, to Pirkei Avot. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, history and hashkafa, uh, sponsored by. Um, the uh, Tel Aviv International Synagogue, under the inspired leadership of Rabbi Ariel Constantine, um, we took it. Took a two. I took a two-week uh, break to uh, for vacation. I hope we were all well. And now we are in uh, the month of Elul, so we're going to. It's a month of new beginnings, a month of, a month of preparation, which we're going to actually discuss uh, in the uh, in the class today. I just will mention uh, in passing in advance that. Um, we will, uh, or I will, have the privilege of uh, leading the congregation on the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I'll announce that again, and um, we will try to make a uh, make the day a uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, a special one in anticipation of the uh, new year of uh, Tavshin Pei Gimel, fifty seven eighty three, and uh, there'll be more information about that uh, as we get closer. Uh, I want to divide the uh, class today into two parts. Uh, I want to complete the Mishnah that we've been dealing with uh, for quite a number of weeks. And then I want to share with you um, some insights that I um, received from um, uh, learning um, the commentary, studying the commentary of uh, Rabbi Adin Steinzal, Zechar Tzadik Levracha, to Likutei Torah of the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, which, um, as some of you know, I have been studying on an ongoing basis for the past uh, almost uh, two years, um, uh, but this uh, particular uh, piece that I'm going to share with you and which going to add some things to uh, has a personal, very personal resonance for me and actually for my relationship with my, uh, with my teacher, my master and teacher, uh, Rav Soloveitchik, Zachar Tzadik Lebracha. But let's start, let's get started, um, let's get started. Um, we had, we are finishing the uh, third chapter, uh, the third chapter, the eleventh Mishnah in the third chapter of um, Pirkei Avot. I'm going to read it through again because we haven't uh, actually, uh, we haven't been, uh, we haven't been together for a few weeks. Rabbi Lazar Modai, the uh, statement is attributed to Rabbi Lazar Hamodai, uh, who was a, uh, a, a Tana, a, a Mishnaic scholar from the uh, second century uh, CE. In fact, he was uh, a central figure in the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, there are those, in fact, who think that he was Bar Kokhba's uncle. Um, the um, Gemara tells us that, uh, I think it's Yerushalmi, that it was his piety that actually um, prevented Beitar, the last, uh, the last um, fortress of, um, of Bar Kokhba, which is not far from the uh, Haredi city of Beitar. It's actually right next to the uh, Arab village of, uh, of uh, Husan, or town of Husan. Uh, next to Husan is Batir, uh, and next to Batir, Beitar, is an area called Chirbet al Yehud, the uh, Churva, the destroyed area that belonged to, that relates to Jews and uh, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish remains, if you want to call it, uh, and uh, that apparently is the site of the original Beitar. In any case, Rabbi Lazar Bodai was wont to say, and you have to understand his words, initially, at least initially, uh, against the background of the revolt and of the. Um, persecutions that were fomented by um, by Adrianus, by Hadrian, by, by Elias Hadrian, uh, against the Jewish religion. So he says, a person who um, who uh, desecrates those things that are sacred, not just uh, sacrifices, although there are indications that the temple was, the temple service was uh, restored for a short period of time at least, um, during the Bar Kokhba revolt, when uh, Jerusalem uh, was recaptured by Bar Kokhba. The person who ta- makes light of or humiliates uh, holidays. Um, generally, as we saw, this refers to the intermediate, uh, the intermediate uh, days of the festivals, Chol Moed, meaning uh, during Pesach and Sukkot. And if you humiliate somebody in public, and if you undo, either you do not, actually you can mean two things, you either do not circumcise your children or you undergo um, 
the uh, very painful uh, operation to undo, as it were, to go through plastic surgery. This is without ether yet. Um, uh, when circumcision, in order to either comply with the edict of uh, Hadrian, which was against circumcision, or in order to be able to assimilate among uh, among Gentiles. Or you misinterpret the Torah. We spent a lot of time talking about this. Even if you have, you're very learned in Torah and you have many good deeds to your credit. And he has such a person has no place in the world to come. The striking part of this, um, the striking part of this uh, sentence of this passage is the. It's in my opinion is the last is this last line. Um, you're talking somebody who desecrates, say, sacra. A person who uh, humiliates or makes light of the holidays. A person who humiliates another person. A person who, who undoes or refuses to circumcise his children or undoes his own. A person who, who, who misinterprets the Torah. Such a person has Torah masim tovim? It doesn't go together. I would think that these are people who don't want any part of the Torah. What are we talking about? Uh, it, it, it really doesn't seem to go to uh, to go together. Now, there this expression of, of even if a person has um, uh, is is very scholarly or very learned, uh, and nevertheless um, there is, and nevertheless suffers um, uh, suffers uh, suffers a punishment, not having a place in the world to come. That phrase pops up in a number of places in rabbinic literature. Uh, one of my favorite examples, but this which is one which is more understandable, I think, is more comprehensible, is the following. Um, um, I, you know, a person goes into a store and he sees a good-looking woman. Okay. So uh, he thinks she's really beautiful and he uh, enjoys looking at her. So what he does is he pays his... Um, he he goes in. Maybe she's maybe maybe she works there. Maybe she owes her money. Whatever the case might be. When he pays her the money, he pays her in small change. And the reason he pays her in small change instead of giving her a check and saying hi goodbye, is because as he's counting out the dollars, as he's counting out the shkalim, as he's counting out the coins, whatever the case might be, he can sit there and stare at her and 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 and, and, and drink and drink in her uh, drink in her beauty, which is. Um, uh, it, it's it's um, exploitative, um, and it also encourages um, the wrong kinds of thinking, the wrong kinds of thoughts, and uh, and and is is um, is certainly something to be avoided because you're not allowed to. We're not we're not allowed to sit there and 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 jump into a sea of uh, sexual uh, of sexual stimulation outside of our relationships with our spouses. Um. All right, fine. So, but there are people like that. They like to stare at good-looking women and they like to take advantage of good-looking women and and, and, and objectify them and, and so on and so forth. It's a sin, and it's not something you should do. Okay, that's not the part that is amazing. It says, Even though he's a scholar and has great deeds, um, he, he's going to be punished. In other words, his, great, his deeds and his uh, scholarship aren't going to save him. I can, you know, but on the other hand, I can... The contrast between the ending and the situation in this latter case it makes a lot of sense. I don't mean I'm not justifying it, but men, especially, um, you know, there is nobody who can. Uh, there's no, but there is no guarantee. There are no guarantees um, that a person is not going to be carried away or is going to be tempted by his sexual drives. Not going to be tempted by his yatzer. It, it it happens and. Um, and so the fact that so the so the so the imp it's the the um, upshot of the statement is don't count on the fact that you're such a big uh, you're big, such a big scholar or you think you're so pious and so on even you can be tripped up by your uh, by your sexual urges, um, or as Chazal say in another place in Apotropos Larais. There's no the, people should re should realize that they that they're that they're vulnerable and uh, be aware of their vulnerabilities and not put themselves in situations. Which may lead them to uh, to uh, to sin. Okay, so that that combination of unacceptable behavior with the person who, who uh, um, nevertheless is scholarly and so on, it makes sense. But this uh, we're talking about people that are are out and out rebels, people that reject some of the most important 
I mean, look what we're talking about here. We're talking about rejection of the, of the of the temple. We're talking about the rejection of the holidays. We're talking about about uh, the the absolute violation of the fact that the, your, your fellow person is uh, is created in the image of God. A uh, person who rejects uh, or undo, yeah, rejects. I mean, the pi- passively or actively, um, the the covenant of, of Abraham with the, with the, with the um, with the Jewish people. A person who distorts the Torah. Um, w- why why would one think why would one think that such a person even if he started out being uh scholarly and pious um that that he would have a place in the world to come big, despite his um you know despite his nefarious uh and nefarious actions um it doesn't it doesn't seem to go together uh, at least not in my opinion i would like to expect um and yet, upon second thought, and I, this is what I'd like to regret, or, 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 or like to suggest to you, and I, as always, welcome uh, comments below uh, once this gets published, is as follows. Sometimes, no, unfortunately, not infrequently, um, people go through uh, very, very... Uh, radical changes in their lives. And it not often happens, and it frequently happens. I'm sorry, I didn't mean not often. Not infrequently happens. That um, people who start off and acquire uh, and are, become Talmud Chachamim, they become uh, uh, quite scholarly and pious, uh, leave it. They take off their kippah, as they say. And uh, not infrequently, they not only leave the Torah, they not only leave observance, but they also turn on Judaism using their um, previous life, using the fruits of their scholarship, to harm it. And their credibility from their previous life to harm it and to bring other people to reject the Torah as well, as in Oh, he was such a big scholar. Look what he did, right? Or I can use my scholarship and now to rip the Torah apart. Um, the um, and there's a pathology to this kind of uh, person. I, I know one person like this um, who is very active in social media. Uh, he um, at one point was apparently a. Uh, very devoted uh, scholar of Torah, a person who apparently was at one time very pious, and chucked it all. He now advocates. Um, he now advocates the end of the Jewish people per se. Uh, he's something of a pagan. Uh, he rejects Abrahamic uh, monotheism. He's a violent and virulent anti-Zionist, uh, suborning uh, and supporting. Uh, forces that would, would that would see the destruction of the Jewish people and the murder of, uh, really effectively the murder of the six and a half million Jews that live here, and yet he takes his he, he always this person always pulls out his um, pulls out his credentials. Says, I got I was ordained by so and so, and I got smicha from so and so, and I am a big Talmud Chacham like and this. So you should listen to me. That's what we're talking about. That's the kind of personality that we're talking about. Person who tur- who after having a cheat gotten a certain level of uh, of accomplishment uh, within Judaism turns on it and uses those uh, those his creds destructively instead of doing the uh, proper thing if he has to leave saying this is no longer part of this is no longer uh, mine and I'm just going to go off and do something else. Um, historically, historically the statement in the context of uh, Merit Bar uh, the, Re- the Bar Kochba rebellion. It makes a lot of sense because there is no, there were people that we know of who were like that. And the classic example is a younger contemporary of uh, Rebbe Lezer Modai, whose name was Alicia Benavuya, who at the time was one of the leading students of Rebbe Akiva. He lost his faith, and he not, didn't just go and become some kind of pagan or Roman. Uh, he uh, he went off and he spent his time being mekatzet uh, benetiot. Uh, undermining uh, the roots of Jewish observance. Some say that he actually went on a rampage to try to um, undermine the faith of, of young, of, uh, young impressionable uh, students, which would be consistent with this kind of uh, 
this kind of uh, behavior and this kind of psych um, uh, this kind of uh, pathology. Um, and uh, this kind and at the same time, this kind of uh, the, 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 this kind of dynamic, as I mentioned, uh, is not just unique to, is not unique to the uh, third second century, the middle of the second century CE, but rather uh, something which is with us all the time. And I think that that's uh, I think the message is that um, one does not give an, a blank check of credibility to a person who has acquired a certain amount of knowledge based on their previous life. Um, in order to give credit credence to what they're doing, um, might do at a later stage of their uh, of their lives mm -hmm. or their career. So I think that's the um, that's the uh, I think the ultimate message of um, the last line in this mission. So we are going to stop there with regard to the mission. We will go on next week to a very statement, a very difficult statement of Rabbi Yishmael, and um, not for now. Now, um, yesterday was the first day of now. Well, a quick shift. Yesterday was the first um, first day of Elul. Uh, it's the beginning of the um, really the beginning of the Yam of the uh, of the um, high holy days. Uh, the function of Elul, as we will see in a minute, is to prepare for Shoshana, for Yom Kippur, and then for Sukkot, which are a unit and a process. And I hope to have more to say about that as we go. Um, the um, discussion in the Likutei Torah of Rav Shalom Zalman of Ladi, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, that I want to share with you in the second half, this in this last ten, last ten minutes of the uh, our discussion today, uh, has a significant resonance for me personally, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, let me start with the, let me tell, start with a story. Uh, my teacher, um, must must much. Missed and beloved teacher, Rav Yosef Dov Halevi Soloveitchik, Zecher Tzadik Levracha, uh, as is fairly well known, was raised, um, uh, he spent the first uh, 13 years of his life, I think, in, oh, no, it's actually not that, except for a short time when he left, he was born, um, in the town of Choslavich. Choslavich is a, was a shtetl in, uh, in Ukraine, actually, um, which wa had a significant, it wasn't totally Chabad, but it had a very, very large Lubavitch um, population. They had a tradition, though, despite that, that the rabbi who they took for the community should be not only a uh, should not only not be a Lubavitcher, not only be a, not be a chassid, but the, not be a, not only be a, not be a chassid, but he should actually be misnagid. He should be from the ranks of the opponents of Hasidut and the students of the Volozhin or Yeshiva, the Yeshiva Volozhin, which is the institutional expression of the entire um, uh, Weltanschauung world outlook of the Vilner Gon, of the Gon of Vilna, the quintessential and the leading opponent of Hasidus. Now, the reason why this happened is um, because, according to legend, um, of, all of, the, um, of all of the leaders of, um, of uh, Russian Jewry, in the time of the Napoleonic Wars against Russia, the one of the few, or it might be the only one, who uh, Jewish Orthodox Jewish leaders who um, who supported the Tsar against Napoleon, was uh, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe for reasons which are not relevant right this minute. Uh, according to the um, according to the uh, the legend the story, um, when the when the um, when the French took uh, the area around Choslavitch and around Lubavitch. The, the, the Reb Shneur Zalman of Ladi uh, went running to Choslavich, and he hid, uh, and he actually found refuge in the in the uh, home of the Rav of the town, who happened to have been an opponent of Hasidus. And the uh, and the Rav took him in and hid him. When the French came, they said, "We are looking for Shneur Zalman of Ladi. Uh, we want to kill him." And this uh, anti-Hasidic Rav said, "Great, wonderful. As soon as you find him." Tell me where he is, I'll kill him for you. Because I think Hasidut is, is something terrible and it's heretical, and believe me, I'll be the first one to turn him in. So they were so impressed with his reputation and what he said that they just left him, they let him go, and that's how the Lubavitcher Rebbe was, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe was saved. Because when the French left, and then they were thrown, then they were driven out of Russia by uh, by the Russian troops, by the Russian troops, and uh, and then and, and, and uh, basically Napoleon started his. Uh, his great retreat from Russia and ultimately uh, his uh, path to uh, path to his um, undoing and his fall, ultimate fall. 
Um, because of the fact that this uh, rabbi was an opponent of Hasidut, and of Lubavitch in particular, he, um, they determined that from then on, the rabbi who they took was going to be a, had to be a, uh, a Litvak, had to be an anti, had to be a misnagid, had to be somebody who opposed Hasidus. Anyways, so Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, the Rav's father, Rav Soloveitchik's father became the Rav of Choslavich, and um, Rav Soloveitchik spent the first, really his four, first ten, ten formative years of his life um, in this town, and he absorbed, because he went to Cheder uh, with Lubavitch kids, and had a head of Lubavitch Malamed, uh, a, you know, Hebrew school teacher, um, he, in, he uh, in, um, internalized a lot of uh, Lubavitch uh, teachings, and uh, he knew Tanya very well, but he especially, he especially loved Likotei Torah, um, especially certain parts of it. He found it inspirational, and it is very easy to find in certain sections of Rav writings the direct influence of, um, of Chabad. And on a number of occasions, uh, Rav Soloveitchik points out, and this is actually true, that the uh, manifesto of anti-Hasidut, which is called the Nefesh HaChaim, written by his ancestor, Rav Chaim of Volozhin, who was the premier disciple of uh, the Vilna Gaon. Here's a, this book. I have it right on top of my... I write on top, right over my, right over my desk. Ultimately agrees, overlaps with the Tanya of the, uh, of the first Lubavitcher Rebbe um, in about 90% of the issues that it raises. Okay. What's, what is this all relevant uh, I started learning with Rosh Soloveitchik in 1973. Um, about, and then, then then I went on to learn with him for another nine and a half years, ten years. Um, about two years before, a year before or two years before, uh, as the um, high holidays were approaching, uh, the Rav uh, announced to his students that he was going to, he wanted to study with them um, some selected sections of the um, Likute Torah of the uh, comments on the uh, on the Torah of the on the Pentateuch by the first Lubavitch Rebbe, as a way of not only halachically, legally, but also um, emotionally and spiritually preparing for the High Holy Days. I don't know what section he um, I don't know what section he taught. But after one class, the students made it very clear that they weren't interested, and they made fun, and they didn't like Hasidus, and so on. They wanted to do just hardcore, um, hardcore uh, Talmudics, the way that they were used to in Rav Soloveitchik's class. And uh, the Rav uh, stopped those lessons. And he complained um, to a number of people that uh, he felt uh, both rejected and dejected, because... Uh, quote, and this is the direct quote from him. Um, I um, he says they want my head, but they don't want my heart. The I see we're getting close to the. We only have like five, six more minutes, but um, the um, the piece, the section of um, the Kutta Torah, which um, I want to share, part of which I want to share with you. I'll do the rest next week. Um, t- lines up so beautifully with many, many things that Rav Soloveitchik says in his writings, that it is clear to me that if this wasn't one of those pieces, the piece that he tried to teach, it certainly could have been. And I feel like by sharing it with you, uh, there's a certain element of justice that I'm doing to my, uh, to my, beloved, uh, to my beloved teacher. So, what is, um, what, what are we going to talk about? If you go through public, if you go through social media, uh, especially Jewish social media, especially traditional and orthodox social media, and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and I have no idea what goes on in TikTok, but I'm so sure it's there too. Um, one of the things that everybody's talking about, and there are all kinds of memes that are going up all around these lines, is that Elul begins again yesterday, and as a result, Hamelech Basadeh, the king is in the field. The king is in the field. Now, what does that mean? That's all the people talking about. Some people don't, so so don't understand what this means uh, that they have that there's a there's a parody of this idea of the king is in the fields with a picture of Elvis in a field because he's Elvis was the king. Right? But let's let's get serious. What does it mean the king is in the fields as a, as a run up to Rosh Hashanah? 
So following the interpretation of a long passage in the Likutei Torah by Rav Steinzaltz, the answer is as follows. Uh, the Alter Rebbe in the, um, in the Likutei Torah points out that uh, it is very common to interpret the, um, in the meaning and the significance of the, uh, word, of the name of the month Elul, the last, uh, last month of the, uh, of the calendar year in the Jewish calendar, as a, an abbreviation for Ani Dodi. Vidodili. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine, uh, which is part of a uh, verse from the Song of Songs. Uh, the beloved is God, and Ani, the speaker, is the uh, people of Israel, or the individual Jew, if you want, as well. The, um, as Rabbi Steinsaltz interprets the uh, Alter Rebbe, uh, Ani Lidodi is a question of the individual Jew or the Jewish people as a whole meaning that I pine for, I long for, I love my beloved, which is God. And the second half of the verse, or the last two letters of the word Elul, of the name Elul, refers to the way that God responds to our to the individual Jews' longings, the Vidodili. God will respond to us by coming close to us. The um, Alter Rebbe, again, following Steinzels, says that actually it's not just the, the, the point of this interpretation of turning the name of the month of Elul into an abbreviation is not just a matter, <coughs> excuse me, is not just a matter of uh, mutuality. It's not just a matter of reciprocity. It goes much deeper. He says that Anila Dodi, for, a per, for the individual Jew to reach out to God, requires preparation. Because when God comes into our lives, he illuminates them. He fills our lives with life, with light. He fills our light with light. But light, if it's not contained in something, dissipates. So what is required of the individual Jew, Anila Dodi, What's required of the individual Jew is to prepare himself as a vessel to receive God's light, to meet God to the degree that a human being is able to, by putting himself in a position of, by repenting, by doing self-introspection, and making oneself ready for the encounter with God so that he can encompass as much of God's presence as he or she is personally capable uh, Anila Dodi, meaning I am from my beloved, and therefore I will prepare. Anything good requires preparation. And that's, as I said, the function of El. Now, what kind of preparation, and how do you know you're supposed to prepare? One of the striking things, one of the striking things about, um, excuse me, about the shift from Av, the previous month, to El, is the fact that it's perfectly normal. You go from one day to the next. And yet, the atmosphere at the end of Av, which is sort of like end of summer, kind of, you know, laid back, um, to the beginning of El, which is charged, from the outside, at least from the to the to the naked eye, is no different, there's, there's like nothing happened. But on a deeper level, as, since we're, so the Jew is supposed to be aware of the fact that we're, right, we're in the run-up to Rosh Hashanah, you should be sensitive to the fact that things are changing, but behind the scenes. Um, how do, so how, if it's behind the scenes, how are you supposed to know? So this is where the uh, parable of the king in the fields come is, comes in. It says that the king is in the field. He says, Let's, I'm going to compare, you, compare it to, a thing, to something. King is in the field. In other words, the king is coming with his retinue, and uh, he's marching through the fields on the way to the palace. Now, while the king is in the field, on the one hand, he's extremely accessible because you, anybody can see him. And people can yell, you know, long live the king. And you can have some kind of impression of his presence, um, of his presence uh, within, within eyesight. In fact, sometimes you can even be aware of the king being here without catching, you know, catching, catching, catching a sight of him or catching a, you know, of seeing him physically. Uh, if you've ever gone to a con to a concert or to a uh, major event with this essential figure, 
if you don't have uh, seats right up front, uh, you may get set, you may you may find yourself way in the back and not see the prince. This is before they had these big you know screens and stuff. You might not see the central figure. You might not see the king or the president or the prime minister or the rock star or whoever it is. But because you're in a crowd of people who um, you know are part of this big experience of being in the presence directly or indirectly of the of the of of this person, a president or king or whatever the case might be, you're caught up with it. You're sensitive to the. You experience sort of like the thrill. You experience the charge of that person of that person being there. So it's un it's a totally unmediated kind of you know encounter with somebody great. But it's not intimate. An intimate relate, or encounter with the king is after the king, this is the Alter Rebbe says, goes into the palace and he sets himself down and he sits down with his appointments and one by one people are allowed in and then you can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with the king in an intimate and, uh, and, effective, uh, and effective way. But the king has got to go from the, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the field to the palace in order to be able to, you know, for a person to be able to go from stage one to stage two. Elul says the Alter Rebbe, is, the, um, is um, the time of the king being in the field. The king is, you're aware of the king's presence. He's made himself somewhat more accessible in terms of being visible or visible or, you know, sen or you sense his presence. But you're not really going to be able to have the kind of encounter with God and the kind of in intimate relationship with God and the kind of introspection with God in the presence of God that you're going to have Rosh Hashanah Kippur. That's a whole other ballgame. But you can't go from point one to point two to without preparation. So what the, the what the parable of the of the uh, king in the field is to tell us as follows: During Elul. We have to be aware of the fact that God is in the process of gearing things up for us to effect his coronation on Rosh Hashanah and ask him for forgiveness on Yom Kippur. So he's there. But you need to be able to be sent, you need to sense the fact that he's there. Now Jews, uh, according to the Alter Rebbe, and this is a point that Rav Soloveitchik used to, point, used to emphasize a lot, uh, Jews um, have a, uh, or should have, an innate, almost meta-rational sensitivity to sanctity. And so, simply, the, the, you should be aware of the fact that the king is in the, uh, that the, king is in the field uh, on your own. But we get caught up in our lives. We get caught up in our day-to-day. Um, -day. And uh, even Jews don't become aware of that fact. But he's there. So how does one get oneself ready or begin to wake oneself up to make oneself ready to be able to uh, to uh, first be aware of the of the coming of the king into his palace and of the high holy days uh, one does that by the very very specific kinds of customs that have been in, instituted for the month of Elul now two of these in particular uh, are of note one is the recitation of slichot. Slichot are, are penitential prayers, which Sephardim, which Jews from Spain, Portugal, and from the Ori and Oriental Jews from the Muslim world, start re started reciting this morning. Now, the major, the, the the central prayer in the slichot is what is called the thirteen attributes of mercy. These are this is these are two verses from the Book of Exodus which were God's response to Moses when Moses said, show me how you work. I want to know more about you. So God said, fine. And he recited these 13 attributes, these 13 qualities, which people can accept, people can understand, people can, can wrap their heads around, if you wish, um, as a way of understanding God in the world. Um, okay? The, the Sepharadim... Or Edotah Mizrach, the Oriental Jews, start reciting these as part of the service by saying, God, the, the, we, God is available to us to at least experience his presence in a beginning fashion. Um, and the way and the way that we should experience it is the same way that God revealed himself to Moses. But we have to make, push ourselves to become, to sensitize ourselves to the fact that behind the, the scenes, the world has actually shifted. The modality of existence, of general existence behind the scenes, behind the curtains, is um, has changed, 
and has gone into high holy day mode. So how do you do that? By reciting the 13 attributes, by re-experiencing that moment in which God revealed himself to Moses, and by saying, oh, we have to make ourselves available, or we have to make ourselves, we have to raise our sensitivity to the fact that, again, that all that the that the that the that the, that the holiness that is floating around in the air because of God's presence in the field, as it were, um, is there. So, in other words, it's a wake up. It's a wake up. Transcend yourself from your and 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 realize that. Remind yourself of what's really happening. The um, Ashkenazi Jews only start saying uh, these uh, slichot um, just before Shoshana. But Ashkenazim, I'm sorry to do this also, though, but the Ashkenazim uh, do something else. Sephardim and Ashkenazim both, but here for Ashkenazim, it's really the only thing that they do. They blow shofar. Start playing shofar every single morning, uh, except for Shabbat, uh, during, the month of, um, during the month of Elul, as a wake-up call, literally. And so why, what kind of, what's the message of the shofar? So here, there's a famous passage from Maimonides, which uh, explains exactly why blowing the shofar it should be sufficient, or is certainly a, 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 um, a, a, a reasonable way of calling people's to attention to the fact that the king is in the field, as it were. Maimonides, in the Laws of Repentance, says um, that uh, the message of the shofar is, wake up. Those of you who are asleep, you're sleepwalking through your lives, because all you're worrying about is your daily tasks and, and, and paying your bills and, and, and going, through your, your, going through your sort of like very humdrum or daily lives. And sometimes you get so caught up in the things of transient worth that you don't pay attention to real, the real story, to what's going on behind the scenes. The chauffeur is here to wake you up and say, yes, make, making a living and, 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 and cooking and cleaning and, 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 and taking care of your family. All that's very important. But you have to wake up and say that that's all transient and there's something of a perpetual and eternal and transcendent value and worth that's going on right now. And, and that is the fact that we are going to, uh, that we are, we are bidden to, uh, uh, to recognize the fact that God is in the fields, God is on his way to his palace, and we're on our way to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and... And we have to prepare ourselves. So, says the Alter Rebbe, at least it's, I understood the way that Rabbi Steins also interpreted him. Effectively, this is my addition, people get caught up, the way the way Maimonides says, in the um, mediocrities of daily life. Something very powerful starts happening. A process begins, starts happening. On the first of El, we are bidden to clean ourselves as vessels to encounter God, to strengthen them so they don't crack. And uh, we're not aware that we're supposed, to, we're supposed to do that. So intellectually, we know have to do something even though we don't feel it yet. So the Sfaradim, Yedot Mizrach, start by reciting reminding themselves of the original way, the time that God revealed himself, pulled back the curtains and revealed himself to Moses. And that's supposed to push us to be sensitive to the increased sanctity, which is flowing into the world. And Ashkenazim, um, Ashkenazim, it's sufficient simply to blow the chauffeur, to wake up. Sephardim do both. Ashkenazim emphasize the chauffeur. Sephardim emphasize the recitation of the 13 attributes of mercy. So here you have a situation in which Jews who are aware of the changes that the king is in the fields, whether they use that image or not, and so they instituted um, practices and shofar to get ready because they realized that if they want to get to Yom Kippur they want to get to Rosh Hashanah they got to start working on it a month in advance that I think is something that Rav Soloveitchik uh, could sign on to because in general one of the major themes of his teachings is that every single 
important spiritual moment in a person's life. It requires preparation and requires study to be able to understand the spiritual moment towards which we are going. I went over a little bit today. I um, will try to stick to the 30-minute format next time. And I uh, look forward to um, resuming on a regular basis our, uh, our meetings. Um, have, a, uh, have a nice day.